Okay, great. We are live. <laughs> Thanks um, for watching us and hello to everyone who's, uh, who decided to join our, you know, uh, YouTube channel, um, YouTube channel of Human Brain Expo, where we're talking about human brain health, uh, wellness, longevity in all possible aspects related to Human Brain Expo. And uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, Sergey Kalinin is actually a professor at UTK, and the thing is why I actually decided to invite him, and we all, honestly, we are super honored to, to have him with us today. He actually works on very amazing subject matter. Uh, it's actually um, AI, human augmented machine learning for designing uh, very smart and unique uh, materials for different type of purposes and it's not just that he has um, he has actually very interesting perspective on the things and uh, he is actually writing writing his perspective in the form of blog and actually when I was I got uh, to know his blog I was absolutely captivated I spent our lots of hours reading because uh, the perspectives on the things that you disclose there, I think absolutely fascinating. And if you're somehow interested in, um, you know, artificial intelligence applications, you know, from, uh, machine learning in different aspects of, you know, life, our science, uh, you definitely have to look at, uh, at his blog and his, uh, you know, perspectives. So, Sergey, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, Evgeny. I really <laughs> like to be here and potentially share things that excite me or I find curious in science. So thank you for inviting mm -hmm. me. Okay, first question. Uh, can you explain like really briefly, what was your the path? Why you actually even got to the idea of implementation of human augmented machine learning in the designing, in the process of designing things? What was your path? How did you discover even in this area? What was the start? What was the behind of it? So that's a fantastic question. So I guess uh, uh, without going really too far into the past, I can say that uh, I have been interested in uh, microscopy for probably the last 25 years. And uh, the great thing about microscopy is that you get to look at the materials on either nanometer scale or even atomic scale and basically see how the matter is organized. And, you know, for quite a while, you think that, okay, imagine that I'm going to look at uh, matter and see atoms, and then I will know everything. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's not the case. It's very difficult to learn how to do it. The instruments that allow you to do that exist, but they're fairly expensive and require many years of training. But uh, in some sense, it is always a good idea to ask yourself, if I do it, then so what, right? So we can see the skies at night. It doesn't mean that we immediately understand where the universe has come from. It actually takes a lot of work and effort to understand what are the laws by which the stars move. And, you know, people start to think about it in ancient Egypt and uh, they come up with uh, some theories that were enough to uh, predict the flood of, uh, of uh, Nile. But that was not science. It was a correlative observations. People did it in ancient England with the Stonehenge. Again, people come up with astronomy. People come up with the beautiful uh, correlative uh, models in the Middle Ages. Again, it was not uh, it was not science. Only with Kepler and later Newton, people were able to learn what are the laws that determine the motion of celestial bodies. And then after that, they were able to infer the history of the universe from that. So in our case, we use microscope to look at atoms. But very often, we don't even ask the question, what does it mean? What can we learn out of that? So I was fascinating with this for quite a while. And I spent first 10 years of my career basically learning how to do that. But about 15 years ago, I realized that just looking at the things is not enough. You need to learn somehow to derive conclusions about what is that that it, you see and what it means. And that, for me, was the fascination with the first mathematical methods for analysis of the data. So kind of use the physics. But the problem is that there is too much data and very often we don't have the clear physical model. So uh, the motion of uh, planets is determined by 
only one law of the gravitation, the motion of atoms and solids are much more complicated than that. And uh, machine learning, or to be more precise, the physics-assisted machine learning, is basically the bridge that allows us to take uh, this observational data and try to get uh, to understand what is behind it. So why the world and why the materials are the way, uh, the way they are, what can we do to make them better, and uh, ultimately, I guess, to kind of what it means to be a, to be a scientist in some sense. It's absolutely fascinating. So seeing things does mean that we actually understand them. And we have, as understood, we have tremendous amount of data and we actually not using it properly, right? We don't have enough understanding um, that would bring all things together and give a better, clear perspective on things. I, I really love this idea. Um, okay, so understood. But in terms of designing advanced materials, atom by atom, to the point that we can actually design a molecules, right? Absolutely artificially knowing, uh, having this tool, so-called algorithm, and basically having this broader understanding of the picture via algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. What what is your? Um, I read several articles of yours about designing, you know, nanomaterials, okay, mm -hmm. using argument reality. The, the question is, can you please give us briefly your perspective, your perspective on the sub on this subject matter and how this perspective can change uh, the reality, the products we have. And what is your vision on this uh, on the subject matter? Absolutely. <laughs> so let's uh, kind of look at the big picture. How does the scientific uh, research generally works? So mm -hmm. uh, generally, imagine that uh, I know something. So I have mm -hmm. uh, some idea of how the world works. I can focus my attention about small part of the world, so nobody knows everything. You generally choose some small part of the world that you want to dig in. So that's kind of what you do when you get in the graduate program. And after that, you get more and more narrow about in the some specific area. And then you uh, start to realize that there are things that you know, or at least you think you know. And then there are things that you are not certain about. So uh, the things that are sort of missing in your uh, vision of the world, there are some elements uh, that are missing. So at this point, you start to ask yourself the question, uh, what may be out there? scientific language, essentially, we create a theories or hypothesis of what can be out there. And hypothesis essentially is the road that we choose to get far into the unknown. The reason why we need hypothesis is that because we cannot move in all the directions at this time, right? So if I think mm -hmm. about uh, moving somewhere, I need to choose a road. If I think mm -hmm. about learning something new about uh, the world, I need to be able to formulate the question. And I'm much better off formulating one or several questions rather than 100 questions, because the more questions, the more, more time I will need to answer them. So once I formulated these questions or hypotheses, then I go out there and I will make an experiment trying to what is called to falsify the hypothesis to find out whether it is the answer is right or wrong or find out some numerical values behind the mechanism. And uh, the nature of the experiment is that very often I learn something, I discover something new and unexpected. So after I get the experimental results, there are two outcomes. On the one hand, I sort of filled in the hole in my picture of the universe. So now I know more about the uh, mechanism that I speculated about. But another thing is that I have a chance to discover something fundamentally new. And then I take this uh, new knowledge and then I start to think it, about it again and kind of I go through the cycle over and over again. Uh, sometimes I will do it myself. Sometimes I will share my results and ideas with people at the conferences or as it may be on LinkedIn or other forms of social media. And uh, that's how science generally works. The important thing is that uh, probably 99% or more of what we are doing is learning and repeating the things that have done before. But there is a small part, very small part of what we do as a scientist, which is actually discovering the new things. And uh, we know that there are very few of them. 
but we know that these things are out there because uh, the new things uh, 80 years ago was semiconductors the new thing 60 years ago was uh, uh, lasers the new things uh, five years ago was large language models so the new things appear slowly but inexorably and uh, very very visibly mm -hmm. so when it comes to uh, material science well material science in some sense is uh, one of the most broad scientists out there so if you mm -hmm. ideally you work on the fairly no narrow and idealized system where you really can understand physics to the degree uh, to the completely if you work in the areas such as uh, battery manufacturing or semiconductors you by necessity work with a fairly narrow range of materials which are directly relevant to your product so material science basically spans the continuum between solid state physics and uh, uh, device fabrication between the uh, chemistry of individual molecules and uh, large-scale production so it's pretty much everywhere yes i love the idea I love the idea. You mentioned one phrase that actually very captivated me. The idea of going beyond human workflow. So you believe, from your perspective, you believe that algorithms and uh, current technology actually help people to go beyond frames let's put this way what actually human workflow frames let's put this way right and that actually will help to discover and create new things right is it did i get things right absolutely so let's look at what how the machine learning is being uh, used now so first of all uh, we have to start with the fact that most of the machine learning methods out there are what is called the big data methods roughly mm -hmm. it means that uh, for example if meta has the access to the pictures of the cats on the internet and it has access to a significant fraction of uh, the worldwide cat population you can sort of interpolate between this data and uh, predict how all other cats will look like so that's kind of entirely possible mm -hmm. so uh, this approach works when you actually have a lot of data and more importantly when this data is representative of the what uh, the total number of objects in the world so for example if we train our network on the images of cats they are not going to predict us how the tigers look like at the same time if the network have seen both cats and tigers it's going to predict everything in between sort of whatever it is so that being said uh, this works when you have a lot of data and data is representative when it comes to actually people making things situation is a little bit different so first of all very often we don't have uh, large data in many uh, industrial or scientific problems we by definition have very little data so why is it so it is so because if we are doing something new for the first time we by definition cannot have a lot of data we start with a very small data so if something is new then it has to come with the small data so the second part uh, the question then becomes can machine learning help us to learn new things faster and here it becomes a kind of a little bit interesting question because uh, when i worked in amazon amazon has a wonderful principle working backward from the problem meaning you identify what is that that you want to do you identify how to build the path from what you already have to where you want to be and then you start to optimize this path one step at a time and for delivering the engineering solution in the short amount of time this is the absolutely best strategy but if we want to discover something new we cannot define exactly the problem out there we have to go somewhere in the new direction the question mm -hmm. because can machine learning help us do that and the answer is it's not clear so we know that machine learning can definitely help us optimize that workflows that already exist so if we know how to make a new battery or how to make how to make a specific battery electrolyte or specific uh, phosphorus for the uh, computer screen or something like this machine learning can definitely help us to do what is called the myopic or greedy optimization 
meaning to optimize uh, our steps one at a time and save us a lot of time and money. But the thing that is less clear at this point is whether the machine learning can help us to discover fundamentally new way of doing things. And uh, in order to do that, the first thing that we need to do is to define what is our reward. So what is that that we are after? If we are doing the basic science, what we do is the discovery. I'm not sure how exactly to formulate this problem in general. In the specific setting, it's doable. For example, in a physical experiment, I can say that my goal is to discover the physical law in the shortest number of steps possible. If I want to do the uh, find a better material, situation becomes a little bit more complicated because it depends how I define the search space. So if my search space is finite, like I want to try all the combination of the uh, atoms in the uh, periodic table organized in the perovskite structure, that's a huge task, but it's doable. So there are groups in Berkeley, or Google Brain, that has done exactly that. But if I want to discover all small molecules, for example, to find the drug targets or something like this, the problem is uh, not tractable. There are more small molecules than there are atoms in the universe. So we cannot just uh, search through all of them. That becomes a much more complex problem of how do you navigate in the infinite dimensional spaces. And the idea is that what can help you is having the idea of what is that that makes this molecule special. So the idea, of course, can be imperfect. It's limited by uh, whatever examples you have available. It can be wrong, and most likely it is wrong. But having some idea or hypothesis is infinitely better than just going in the random direction and invest time and effort into making everything. Got you. Um, well, this discussion, especially when you mentioned Amazon, you mentioned um, Google Brain. You know, um, especially broader audience, I think, because our channel is publicly open for everyone. And um, the question is, a lot of people have assumption that we, uh, the computer can be, can have um, the power of our computer is absolutely like, th there is no limits. There is no limits. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to make a question regarding the material design for high perform performance computers. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about, when we're talking about the algorithms, suggestions, uh, uh, theories, uh, that summarizing huge amount of data, the question is what the, what is the current limits of the computers, uh, in terms, in terms of speed of the um, of the work they're able to perform because a lot of people they believe that there is a, you know a, a absolutely unlimited possibility currently exist but we all who are somehow related to science will know that there is no such a thing there are lots of limitations involved and of course there are you know quantum computing computing etc etc uh, that been existed uh, the idea of it being existed for many, many years. Um, I want to just to hear your perspective on things. What do you think about the current situation with, with the computers? And what do you think, uh, how far we can go? Okay, there are multiple ways uh, to look at that. So first of all, computers are physical, right? And the part that yes. uh, they're physical means that there are limits uh, how exactly... Physical, metal, yes. So, for example, about uh, maybe 15 years ago, I have been on the semiconductor roadmap meetings when the new concepts for the computing have been uh, discussed. And uh, one of the problems that was clear at that time, that the rate at which computers work is interestingly limited by how much heat they generate. So if we try to run the computers any faster than they run now, they will simply overheat. So. 15 years ago, we had uh, several gigahertz processors, and now we have several gigahertz processors. We cannot run them faster because otherwise they will simply melt. So interestingly, the second uh, limitation on uh, computer power that mankind has uh, can have is uh, actually the power consumption. So the 
data centers that belong to Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and so on, they already use a significant fraction of the energy generated in the US, so several percent, which basically means that we can scale it by a factor of 10, maybe a factor of 20, but probably no more than that, unless we come up with a, a new ways of computation that use uh, considerably less power for the same amount of uh, for the same amount of compute. So the same thing applies to the uh, to the uh, to the communication. So interestingly, the network and Wi-Fi everywhere also takes a lot of power. So one of the limits is going to be uh, simply practical. We cannot keep building them. There would be diminishing return on investment. Second part, which is uh, a little bit more philosophical, but still exceptionally important, is that not everything can be done by scaling up the computational power. So imagine that we have a, for example, imagine that we have a certain theoretical model. So mm -hmm. we can use this model for prediction of uh, material or molecular properties, but the model is not reality. So model at some point always will start to diverge from reality at some point. The way that we deal with the situation is that we perform the modeling, we run the experiment, given the experimental result, we uh, make our model better. But if we keep the models the way they are now and do not improve them through the feedback with the experiment, then simply investing in the computational firepower is not going to move us uh, too far. Of course, we can always invest in uh, computation and theory, of course, we will have a better results, but at some point it would be a diminishing return. And finally, most important point is that everything said and done, we are living in materials world. So ultimately, we actually need to get stuff. So it really doesn't matter who uh, calculate what type of molecule until this molecule is actually made. It is not going to be particularly useful. It's just a concept. Somebody, If somebody predicts the mat uh, material with the unique superconductive properties, not only uh, we don't know whether it is true or not until it is made, for a real world application, we have also to make it at scale and incorporate it in the existing technological trees. So it, uh, I think we are actually now at a very exciting times where the computational technology, they didn't get exactly, they didn't exactly hit the ceiling, but in some sense, you can say that the say large language models already have access to virtually all the texts that have been created by humans. You can say that the uh, ImageNet or uh, uh, modern analysis, uh, models like MidJourney or whatever, they already have seen all the art created by humans. Mm -hmm. However, this is all what has been done before. If we want to do something new, we need to learn how to... Uh, machine learning methods can help us to choose the direction. They can help us move faster, but we still will need to go out and do things. A slower thing, which is, however, is also very important, is the tools, right? So currently we have some set of tools that allow us to whatever, look at the sky or uh, make materials and devices. And the tool development is uh, actually much slower than development of new materials. So the progress in techniques like electron microscopy or scanning probe microscopy or other forms of imaging is fairly slow. It's not zero, but in some sense, our uh, capability to understand the universe and answer uh, complex questions and improve our models depends on how well developed our physical tools. Without them, we can calculate as much as we want. There would be a diminishing return with the calculations. Uh, super. I mean, it's... It's just very interesting encapsulating. Um, in terms of... And in terms of getting information in terms of understanding how the actual world means um you in one of your articles you're mentioning piezo response force microscopy <laughs> you're oh, mentioning sorry. that usage of this type of microscopy for understanding the uh, you know um electromagnetic communication between you know um in biological systems in very you know sophisticated small mm, organelles, let's put it this way, and, mm -hmm. you know, systems. Uh, as I know, you've been uh, involved or you're still involved in this sort of research. Mm -hmm. The question is, are you developing this type of microscope 
microscopes? What is your part of the research? Tell me a little bit your perspective and your and your participation in this in the in this subject matter. Because oh, you, as I understood the whole idea of uh, piezo response force microscopy is very important for the actual understanding, right? How things work, getting those information, getting this imaginary information, right? So uh, that's an excellent question. And uh, in, indeed, PFM is something that I'm doing uh, hands-on. So for techniques like electron microscopy, I collaborate with people who actually run the electron microscopes. That's not something that I do myself. Uh, piezo response microscopy and other forms of SPM is basically the sort of real world element of my uh, research. And interestingly enough, in some sense, uh, I kind of got pushed into the direction of uh, using machine learning for microscopy uh, exactly because uh, piezo response microscopy is fairly unique in the way it works. So let me start from the very beginning. So what is PFM? Mm -hmm. So imagine that you have a, a piece of materials, for example, the piezoelectric crystal in the zipper lighter. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. If you take a piece of material and uh, touch it and apply electric bias to it, this piece of material is going to expand and contract a little bit. This expansion and contraction is very small. So it's uh, of order of uh, several tens of picometers. So it's roughly comparable. If you apply one volt, then this expansion and contraction would be comparable to roughly the radius of the hydrogen atom. So it's very little. But the unique thing about the scanning probe microscopy, why they're called atomic force microscopy, is because they are sensitive to exactly this level of displacement. So it turns out that the way PFM works is that if you apply your bias to your probe, then your objects start to vibrate. You essentially zap it and start to uh, wiggle and you can detect this wiggliness exceptionally well. And the second interesting step, uh, which uh, make this technique quantitative, is that uh, the amount by which material expand or contract really does not depend on the material size. So if I apply one volt to the crystal, which is a meter, centimeter, or a micron, this expansion and contraction would be exactly the same. This is very unusual. And that also means that these measurements are quantitative. So for anybody who is a physicist, quantitative means it makes a big difference because if the measurements are quantitative, then you can build the whole foundation of quantitative measurements, do them as a function of conditions, do it as a function of some external parameters. So it becomes a really powerful method to explore materials properties on the nanoscale. If the measurements are not quantitative, you generally get uh, beautiful pictures and then you can uh, discuss for quite a while what they mean and why they're interesting, but that's a very different type of science. The thing that makes PFM is exceptionally useful is that, uh, so I mentioned that you, if you take a quartz crystal from the lighter, it will have a piezoelectric properties, but it turns out that the materials that we use in the batteries, like a battery cathode that is in the laptop or cell phone or whatever, if we apply bias to it, it also will expand and contract. So it turns out that the piezo response microscopy can actually be used to study the properties of the batteries and the fuel cells. And uh, that becomes a little bit of the game changer because generally we don't know what happens in these materials on the level of the several nanometers. So with the PFM, we can visualize it and sort of probe how the electrochemical processes happen. Another interesting aspect of the piezoelectric materials is that it turns out that all biological systems are actually piezoelectric. So you know that uh, all the proteins and the uh, uh, DNA molecules, what's not, they have the uh, special type of symmetry, so they're uh, optically active, and they have a polar bonds. So the uh, yeah. CO and H bond that builds the protein is actually polar. So it turns out that combination of these two properties is enough to make the material piezoelectric. And... Uh, about uh, maybe 15 years ago or so, uh, we ran an experiment when we simply used this method to look at the uh, bone or tooth tissue. And lo and behold, the proteins will actually bright, uh, bright up because they're piezoelectric and the remainder of the bone is not. That was actually very interesting. And we published the paper about repeating the Galvani experiment 
So Galvani was applying electrical bias to the frog leg, and the frog was uh, frog leg was uh, kind of twitching. Mm -hmm. Applied the electric bias to both on the length scale of the several nanometers, and we saw this twitching on the length scale billion times smaller than Galvani has done his experiment. So that is definitely a super interesting technique. Yes, and it provides a lot of perspective on on uh, information we can get. And as I understood, this this type of information will help us to design a more uh, functional, smarter materials on the nanoscale, right? In the perspectives. Uh, that's something that one can hope. So you know, when you're <laughs> like, uh, we can hope. <laughs> You need to make a difference between something that you are certain about and something that you can speculate. So generally, uh, I'm certain that this is the way how we can learn the structure of the complex biological tissues or structure of the active regions of the batteries or fuel cell on the nanoscale. Uh, how to combine this information and the overall vision of what makes this material tick and how to improve them, that's a different story. So the first one is definitely something that can be done and it has worked before. The second is, I mean, I build my research program at UT with this type of studies as one of the foundational elements. But that's something where I want to go. I cannot predict where I and my colleagues will get there and I cannot predict what type of answers we are going to get. So sometimes when you do science, the answer becomes not particularly interesting. You can learn that, okay, you see a interesting phenomena it definitely makes life very interesting, but uh, this phenomena are not necessarily relevant to your ultimate goal. So we don't know in advance. Oh, uh, understood. Well, uh, you never know. Uh, you know, uh, it's a matter of, I guess, uh, we will see in the future. Uh, some practical aspect needs to be done. Data uh, gotten uh, according to, you know, according from the experiment. Also, to continue this conversation, to continue this conversation, very quick question. You mentioned, you've been mentioning uh, this idea a couple of times during the conversation. And I believe this question will be a good, like, continuation of the, uh, of the last statement, you, you, you know, you said. So... Thinking about the future of experiment, of scientific experiment, scientific experiment, as a researchers, taking into account, uh, taking into account the above mentioned, everything you said, what will be how scientific research, uh, your vision of the scientific research in the future in terms of the usage of uh, algorithms, uh, computers um, and a human uh, being involvement in the process and the whole idea of how we actually can control and get involved in terms of, you know, data gathering, creation, interpretation of things. Mm -hmm. Can you bring like pers <laughs> your perspective on things, on this type of thing? Actually, I think that uh, for... Again, I uh, cannot generalize because, you know, scientists can talk about the areas yeah. that where the domain experts, when they start to talk about the things that they don't know about, uh, that maybe not necessarily the best idea or... Well, it's, it seems speculation, but it, it is still perspective. It's still valid because it's perspective. But uh, when it comes to the areas that I am familiar with, which is primarily microscopy and to some extent materials design, at this point, it looks like that uh, with the machine learning workflows, we will simply rebuild the microscopy as the fundamentally, in a fundamentally new way. So what I mean by that is that microscopy as the field, of course, exists starting from the Van Leeuwenhoek times and uh, who invented the optical microscope from Ernst Ruska, who depended electron microscopy, and uh, Binning and Royer, who de uh, developed the scanning probes. So for both electron and uh, scanning probe microscopes, the way they basically work has not changed from the time of their development. So we always use our beam to scan our surface to sort of to explore it uh, one point at a time. We use uh, our microscope sometimes to focus on one point and do the detailed studies. And for essentially 70 years, microscopes have been developed in such a way 
that microscope and human go hand in hand. So the human tells the microscope what to do. Human uh, perception is used to look at the screen where the information data is visualized. Human is the one who is making decisions. What is the next step to take? So the reason why I was able to run the program and scanning probe microscopy and then basically seamlessly switch to do both electron and scanning probe microscopy is because on the level of operation, these methods are absolutely the same. And they are very similar to other observational techniques like optical microscopy, uh, chemical imaging, even astronomy. So, however, uh, the progress of the tools is such that in principle they can operate much faster than the human. So electron microscope can generate the data every millisecond. If we use electron microscope to manipulate matter by moving atoms around, we can do it uh, thousands times faster than the human can control it. The same thing applies to interpretation of the data, right? So imagine mm -hmm. that you learn to run the microscope. So in the first maybe several training sessions, you learn the basics. After two or three years, you're basically as good as anybody else in the world. So the experience in microscopy start to go not only in how can you run the tool, but how well can you make decisions when you look at the screen and how you interpret the data that the microscope is generating. Because you need to make decisions what to do next in real time. And again, we are getting to the point when uh, microscope can generate data much faster than human can do, uh, can analyze it. The data can be multidimensional, even for the images, right? So our computer screens have the resolution something like 1,000 by 2,000 pixels. So the reason for that is that if we make it 5,000 by 5,000, that would be oversampling. So that is much higher resolution than the human eye can generate. So if microscopes are fast, they can generate the images which are simply much larger than human can comprehend. So one thing that uh, uh, um, uh, my colleagues uh, at uh, UT and uh, Oak Ridge are now working on is basically taking the whole microscopy as a process, taking it apart and reassembling it back with the machine learning agent, uh, basically uh, riding uh, operating the microscope in parallel with the human. And that means that we start to do totally different decisions. So normally, if I run the microscope, I say, look at this region, do this, uh, take the spectrum here. With the machine learning in the loop, it becomes totally different. I can say that I'm interested in this particular hypothesis. Please try to find out what do the dislocations do in this uh, material and configure the experiment yourself to learn it in the smallest number of steps. Or I can run the experiment where I say that I'm interested in this particular feature in the spectrum because it represents some aspect of the quantum physics that I'm interested in. Please find which of the atomic configurations actually manifest this behavior strongest. And then I can tell the machine learning agent uh, something like, OK, I want you to focus on this specific problem and just narrow zoom in on this specific discovery or I can tell the machine learning agent to actually go broader and just explore what happens in this material. So this is not a dream. We actually have the workflows where this type of uh, analysis have been done on the uh, post acquisition data sets. So you, before you deploy the code on the uh, $5 million electron microscope, you really want to de-risk it on the uh, somewhat less expensive environment. But these things are going to work. And uh, the big part here would be played by the uh, large language model. So we're just starting to do that. Uh, comparatively, in the chemical synthesis, there is already great work by folks like Gabe Gomez at the Carnegie Mellon and uh, Andy White uh, at Rochester, who already demonstrated that uh, large language models can be helpful in design of the chemical synthesis. But the same thing applies for microscopy. We can come up with the natural language prompts about asking the questions, what is the uh, potential origin of this phenomena? These models are not going to do the discovery for us, but they can really help us streamline human operation. They can help us formulate the hypothesis, and uh, that will make the research much more fun. Understood. 
uh, it's uh, very fascinating and, 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 and interesting. Um, so it's going to be so understood the future that we're going to see it's more involvement, involvement of the algorithm that uh, been developed, plus the human kind involvement as a controller. So it's definitely the, uh, the research is definitely going to go beyond the uh, human being capabilities. Uh, because of the tools we have currently, and it's going to be just with some sort of human being control of the tools we have, right? So in some sense, uh, what is going to happen is that, uh, so think about it this way. So whenever mm -hmm. we run an experiment, we always have some purpose in mind, right? So we never run yes. an experiment with the kind of no idea. We either have a specific hypothesis or we have the implicit hypothesis. So why we are doing something. So machine learning algorithm is not going to uh, create this uh, target or in machine learning, learning language reward for us. The reward comes from the human society. It's driven by my curiosity as operator. It can be driven by uh, what research program I got funded. It can be driven by specific need to design some material if I work in industry. Uh, but there is a driving force. So there is a reward. Mm -hmm. This reward is outside of the context of the machine learning agent running the microscope. There is a second part to it. There is always a prior knowledge. So we never work on the system that uh, we don't know anything about. We always know where the sample came from. We always have some additional information in terms of physical properties, history, and so on and so forth. So the, uh, we obviously also know the uh general physics uh, of these materials and physics in general so this constitutes the prior knowledge so the purpose of the machine learning agent becomes to given what we think is the reward of the experiment what we want to discover and having the prior knowledge to uh, try to fill in the blanks in our knowledge in the smallest number of steps now what is the role of the human in this process so mm -hmm. microscopes and uh, machine learning algorithms can be very fast, but at least for the time being, we don't expect them to get a high level decisions. So what machine learning algorithm is going to do is to uh, run fast, low level decisions. So elementary steps, move the probe here, do this type of measurement, move the probe here, do this type of measurement. What the human is going to do is to provide a fairly slow, so compared to uh, microscopes, humans are slow, but uh, provide the human level, but high, uh, human, uh, sorry, human latency, human speed, but uh, high level decisions. And these decisions and uh, the way we interact with the instruments would be very different from what they are now. Rather than telling uh, the microscope, go here and do this measurement, we can take the algorithm, be more curious or be less curious try to modify this type of objects or try to modify this type of objects. And of course, as a humans, we would also be able to consult the expert systems, including those based on the large language model. So I see something unusual during the experiment. There is always serendipitous discoveries. What may it be? So I can query the expert system and uh, the expert system can tell me that, look, this is how the dislocation looked like. And uh, if the dislocations are relevant to the science that I want to explore, they ca I can on the fly reconfigure my experiment to study the properties of the dislocations rather than properties of the grain boundaries. So that's kind of going to be a fundamentally new way. In some sense, we kind of may work this way, but typically we go from one uh, working hypothesis to another one uh, in the cycle that literally takes days and months. We take the data, uh, we analyze it, we talk to our colleagues, we come up with a new hypothesis, we come back to the microscope. The process will generally take uh, weeks and months. So now we would be able to concentrate this uh, process in uh, literally one session on the microscope. The same thing applies to, uh, complicate, to uh, more combined workflow when we use microscopy to make a better material. So after all, we are not doing microscopy just because we are curious, right? We do it as the part of a more broad experiment to make a better material for fuel cell or build the material for quantum information system or something like that. If we can run the microscopes 
and uh, ask and answer questions on the vastly accelerated time scale that means that we can provide the feedback for people who make materials on the much faster time scale and of course it becomes a question of why this feedback is useful so we really need to start invest uh, more time and effort into connecting this uh, branches of science that we are doing uh, rather than perfecting one science at a time but machine learning allow us to do that perfect uh the time is almost over thank you so much uh last question last question can you please recommend books or courses for people that you think would be really uh helpful and useful in terms of understanding understanding of of the field can you please recommend a couple of books you know that's or actually, sources that's actually <laughs> Certainly a difficult question because uh, many of these areas are just evolving and uh, for many of this uh, it is possible to gain the general knowledge but it typically comes from reading blogs or experimenting by yourself so it's not mm -hmm. something for which there are uh, books or even the review papers so machine learning is developing exceptionally fast and one of my colleagues in Argon, Ben Blazek, has analyzed the publication activity. So publication mm -hmm. activity is generally a good indicator of how many scientists work on some specific project. And it turns out that until maybe 2017, 2018, if you look, uh, do the search for machine learning and physics or machine learning and materials, it's almost zero. For areas like chemistry, that's a different story. There was a very healthy activity before it just accelerated over the last five years. So that being said, uh, when uh, so I started to work uh, on the machine learning in the domain areas uh, in about 2014, 2015, when Oak Ridge have uh, built a five year program called the Institute for Functional Imaging of Materials. And the general recipe that I come up with that time is that if you are a domain scientist, meaning you're a physicist, mm -hmm. a chemist, a biologist, and if you want to start to apply machine learning in your problem, the first thing you need to do is you need to essentially forget about the domain science. You really need to pay your dues and spend uh, some amount of time by picking up the basic concepts of the machine learning. And many of these concepts are completely orthogonal to uh, scientific concepts. So science is hypothesis driven uh, and strongly causal. There is a cause and effect. Machine learning is generally big data and uh, correlative. There is no cause and effect. There is only correlation. And uh, it is virtually, at least in my experience, it is virtually impossible to learn machine learning if you keep thinking like a physicist. So you need to make a conscious effort to stop thinking for a physicist, at least for some time. After mm -hmm. learning the basics, mm -hmm. then the interesting part starts. Then it is the time when you start merging the new concept that you learn from the machine learning field and the concept that you knew from physics. That is when it becomes really interesting. And this is when the most of the actually breakthroughs are done, because sometimes you discover absolutely unexpected, or at least initially unexpected, connection between the physics and the machine learning. For example, uh, one of the popular concepts in machine learning is so-called the disentanglement of representation in the variational autoencoders. So in some sense, you use it if you have this uh, filters in Facebook or Twitch or whatever, when you see how you would look like if you wear glasses or how you would look like 10 years old. This is essentially done through the manipulation of this latent representations. So it turns out that the same type of concepts exist in physics, except that they're called the order parameters. So the way to connect it is to take your physical da data from physical imaging and uh, try to combine it with this variational autoencoder and then you basically find what are the uh, factors of simplicity in the physical system or what are your order parameters so these connections make it uh, really really interesting after that once you start to get uh, both of this then then it's that's what the science is then you get to experiment practically uh, my favorite way of uh, learning is uh, actually twofold so if you want to get the hands-on skill, there are excellent things, uh, books with the code on the, for example, publishing or manning. So generally, mm -hmm. if there is 
the topic uh, that I'm interested in, and uh, if this topic is relatively well uh, established, I will simply go through the book, go through the exercise. I will not be a good programmer ever, but at least going through this, things help me develop physical concepts and uh, intuition to what I'm is that that I'm working on. Another thing that's surprisingly very good in building the understanding, if not necessarily coding skill, is going to the blogs. So very often there are blogs like Beyond Data Science on Medium and so on. And some of the blogs mm -hmm. are written by the students who actually learn new concepts. Many of them would be uh, okay, but nothing special. But sometimes people learn something and they share their understanding. And uh, I mean, I'm obviously kind of not a graduate student for kind of more than 20 years now, but sometimes the insights that people make in understanding the new concept, my understanding for me quite easier. So these are the two primary ways how I learned to apply ML for a uh, real world problem. Everything else, as you can imagine, is a lot of frustration when things don't work or things don't come together and so on and so forth, but that's, that's normal. Very interesting. I mean, I think it's a, um, I absolutely believe we live in a very uh, fascinating time frame. And there are lots of things to discover, as I understood, right? <laughs> you know, it is a funny thing that about two or three years ago, uh, I was giving a several presentation in Switzerland for uh, UT Knoxville students. And that was a presentation about uh, to which extent machine learning is useful in science. And the thing is that uh, when I was born, my parents were scientists back in Russia. The computer technology in Russia was maybe a decade behind the US. So when I was 10 years old, I've seen the computers that operate on the punch cards, right? So that was not that long ago. It was uh, essentially 35 years ago. And uh, then starting from... Uh, 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 late 80s and 90s, uh, all the software that we use in science appeared. So things like Word, Origin, Excel, Mathematica, all this program appeared in the late 80s or early 90s. And the presentation I was making is that typically scientists think that we have access to the best tools. It's kind of normal, if you will, scientific arrogance. However, uh, the real world in the 15, last 15 years changed completely. So once the cell phones appeared, once the Google, uh, Facebook, and so on appeared, our everyday life changed completely. However, the way we do science in our offices and labs did not. We used the same tools that existed essentially 30 years ago. But uh, what ha is happening now is that this observation didn't age very well. Now the landscape of science changes completely. The way we publish papers is likely to change completely because now we can publish papers which have the code. The way we read the literature is going to change completely because now we can use large language model to summarize it. The way we run experiments can change completely is because now the instruments can be connected to the cloud and the expert systems and it's just going to the complete terra incognita. And the thing that makes it a very interesting is that last time this type of uh, revolution happened was when the personal computers appeared. But personal computers appeared slowly, right? You still need to buy it and you need to learn how to use it. Everything that relates to the software can appear almost instantly. You don't need to buy anything other than whatever, pay $20 to open AI for the chat GPT access. So the software component can essentially change overnight. Hardware component is a different story. So it will still take uh, years for the hardware available in the labs to evolve, for the instruments to develop the APIs to connect to the cloud, for the uh, ecosystem of the codes to become available. So there would be some time uh, for this transition. But compared to the previous 30 years of things being roughly the same, it would be a very, very dynamic time. Amazing. I mean, I like it. I mean, I'm taking classes, by the way, <laughs> learning currently. I I understood, um, as you mentioned, I understood that it's absolutely, it's like vital skills because you definitely, if you want to, we live, it's the world we're going to live, you know, and uh, it's very good um, 
idea to get a perspective, at least on the basic level, of what's going on behind and how actually things work. Uh, well, thank you so much. It was absolutely interesting and fascinating conversation. I really, really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate your time. My pleasure, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And by the way, uh, when it comes to learning machine learning, even that is not clear what it is going to look like, right? Because uh, again, until 10 years ago, I could do things just knowing math without knowing programming. For the last 10 years or so, in my case, five years, learning to program is very important. But now you can write a prompt to the chat GPT and essentially you need to be able to read the code and understand what it does. But you already have the AI helping to write uh, the code. So some of the things that you see people do with the even early prototypes of code uh, generated by the voice prompt is already absolutely amazing. So you'd need to uh, uh, understand machine learning to understand the logic of what you're doing, because otherwise you can easily go wrong. But uh, what it is going to look like in two or three years is anyone's guess. So it's a very exciting time. And uh, I think that uh, human brain is going to change quite significantly in the next several years. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely agree on this point. Okay, I'm finishing the recording. Thank you so much. Talk to you okay. soon. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.